Well, welcome to Calvary Assembly Online this Sunday morning, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. If you just tuned in, I'm so glad that you're here. We're actually in a series where we're looking at the short stories of Jesus, and we're in Matthew, the 12th chapter, and this is how it reads. Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked An adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment of this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through uh, arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept, clean, and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And then the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. Um, I think invisible enemies are the most difficult to fight. Uh, We're dealing with this right now with COVID-19. Uh, There's a virus that we cannot see, but it's obviously in lots of places. And people who are exposed to it, uh, some seem to recover really well, lots of people do, and some do not. Uh, There's more to invisible enemies than just viruses. The Bible indicates that there are spiritual enemies too. And spiritual enemies are also invisible. And I have to acknowledge, to the mind of the modern man, this comes across as superstitious and primitive. Uh, How could you believe in such things? Invisible enemies are the hardest to fight. Jesus understood how our world actually works. He knew that there was visible things and invisible things. And as a result of that, he was able to act as an agent of freedom and of healing. When you understand how the world works, how it actually works, you can bring healing and freedom. So earlier in that chapter, there's actually an example of Jesus healing a man with an atrophied hand. It was it was withered, it was weak, and he was hiding it, and Jesus actually performs a miracle, and his arm and his hand is restored. And then there's also a story of an individual who was unable to see and unable to speak, and the Bible says that Jesus cast an impure spirit out of him, and the result was is he was able to see and he was able to speak again. And I know there are lots of people who look at that and they think, how superstitious that people would believe that every challenge physically that a person would face has some kind of spiritual overtone to it. And that's not what the passage teaches. But Jesus could tell the difference. There are times when there is a spiritual undertone. There is a spiritual reality. And Jesus would deal with that. And you might be today in a situation where you can't see beyond today. You can't see what your future might look like. You can't see what options are available to you. Or maybe you're in a position where you feel like you've lost your voice. You can't speak up and you can't speak out because you're so afraid of what you might lose. And what Jesus might say to you is, Maybe there's a spiritual force at work that if there was freedom brought brought to you from that invisible reality, that in fact you would find freedom and healing from the very things that are keeping you unable to see and unable to speak. So these individuals who saw this, they're religious experts, they saw these miracles that Jesus had done, and then they turn around and they asked him for a sign. Now just think about this. Jesus has actually performed a miracle, uh, causing a person with an atrophied hand to be completely healed, and a person who was blind and unable to speak to be completely healed. And they said, what we need is a sign. And what they're really saying is that they're not interested in the information Jesus has to share. It's a really polite way to say that they're resisting who Jesus is, 
who he claims to be, and what he has come to do. And what's interesting in this story is that Jesus actually cares about people, even the ones who prejudge him. Like they've, their arms are folded, their, their, their eyebrows are down, their, their, their faces have scowls on them. They don't like what he has to say. They don't like what he's preaching or teaching. They don't like what he's doing. And it would be so easy in that moment just to become super defensive or super angry or, or just walk away. And Jesus doesn't do any of that. Uh, Jesus cares for people even who are opposed to him or who prejudge him. And so Jesus begins a teaching session, and he begins to talk to them about a danger that they are unaware of. They don't see it. It's not obvious to them. There's an attack that's going on right at that moment, but it's not the one they perceive. They assume that the only attack is the attack of opinion against Jesus. But what Jesus says and what he reveals is that there's another attack going on, and it's actually on them. He starts with this response. He said, there's not going to be any sign that's given. No sign is going to be given to this generation other than the sign of Jonah. And now you have to know a little bit about the prophet of Jonah to know what that's about. And actually, uh, Jonah was asked to go to a very wicked city and to preach to them. And what happens is, uh, after he eventually goes there uh, and he preaches, the entire city repents. But he didn't want to go there, and he actually headed in a different direction to begin with. And the result was is that there was a whole series of events that wound up with him spending three days and nights in the belly of a very large fish. And uh, Jesus says, that's the only sign you're going to be given. Just like Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, will spend three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah didn't go in and, and do a lot of miracles. He, he didn't perform a lot of signs. He just preached and called people to see God differently. Uh, and what Jesus then focuses on is that, in fact, all of Nineveh repented. Like The entire city turned around. They, they re-examined how they were living, how they saw themselves, how they thought about God. And they, they did a complete about face. Like they turned towards God. All of Nineveh repented. And, and he, Jesus looks at them and said, there's someone that's a lot greater than, than Jonah who's present. And then the great queen of the south is how he refers to. We know from scripture it's, it's uh, Queen Sheba. And she comes from the ends of the earth because she's heard about the incredible wisdom that a king in Israel has. His name is Solomon. And she comes a long way just to hear that wisdom. And, and what Jesus tells them is there's someone that's greater than Solomon that's present. And yet you don't seem to be interested in repentance. And you don't seem to be interested in wisdom. Jesus identifies a great danger, not of them being evil, but of them being empty. That their life isn't filled with bad things. Their life is actually empty. And this is how he reveals this truth to them. He tells a story of an individual who'd had an unclean demonic spirit that was resident within this individual. And this spirit is cast out. And it goes to faraway places and dry places and tries to find another place to live. And uh, eventually, it decides it's going to go back to the place that it had lived before. And when he gets back, he finds that it is empty and clean. It is empty and clean. And so he develops a new strategy. He doesn't want to be evicted out of this place again. So he goes and he finds seven other spirits that are even worse than himself. And he brings them in with him. And the idea is, is that now he's going to take up residence in every nook and cranny of that individual's life so that the possibility of that person living in freedom is much more difficult to realize. See, this is something people don't understand about Jesus. Jesus didn't come into our world just to clean it up. Jesus came into our world to fill it up. I have come that you might have life and that you might have life to the full. You and I were created by God to be receivers and receptacles and containers of God's grace and God's truth, to be containers of God's spirit. 
This is what he's called us to be, not just to be clean and put in order, to, but to be full of his presence and of his spirit. This is how it says it in John, the first chapter. It says, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then John 14 says this, anyone who loves me and obeys my teaching, my father will love him and we will come to them and we will make our home with them. It's the intention of God to take residence in us, to, to take his abode in us, to fill us up with his presence and with his spirit. And scripture is actually filled with lots of examples of people who received Christ into their lives. And they didn't just clean up their act. They were filled up with the Spirit of God. And that made a huge difference in their life. Our greatest and most difficult battles are often against the things we cannot see. And the solution is not a special pair of glasses that helps us see all the unclean spirits that roam the earth. The solution, according to Jesus, is that our heart would be filled with the Spirit of God. That's what makes the difference. Empty lives can be horribly susceptible to dark things. Let me say that again. Empty lives can be horribly susceptible to dark things. For the example, for example, a person who feels very empty and who struggles uh, with guilt. Even when good things are possible in their life, they will step away from them and they will reject it. They, they will let go of it because they don't feel like they are worthy of having a good thing in their life. The emptiness uh, of guilt actually keeps them from embracing other things. And the result is, is that their life winds up getting filled with things that even increases their guilt all the more. But there's another thing that can come into an empty life, and that's judgmentalism. It's so easy just to look around the world, and you can always find an example of someone who's doing uh, life with lesser standards than you have. It's so easy to see how much better others could be if they would simply try. By the way, there's probably some people who are looking at us that way too. The point is, is that once you allow judgmentalism in, you can still look very clean, but you also look down at everyone else. And our world is never changed by judgmentalism, at least not for the better. Our world winds up experiencing the pain that flows out of the dark things that come around guilt and the dark things that come around judgmentalism. So God calls us to be forgiven, which is a good feeling, right? If you've ever actually been forgiven for something. If someone ever uttered those words to you and, and you heard them say, I forgive you, and you knew they meant it, that's a great feeling. And in a way, you feel clean. Like the things that you have done are now, are now done away with. They're, they're, they're taken off. You're, they're, you're not being punished for them any longer. You feel forgiven. But forgiven isn't all that God came to do. God has come to fill us. He wants us to be full not just of religious-looking things, but full of him, full of his presence, full of his spirit, full of his joy, full of his peace, full of his kindness, full of his generosity. This is what God intends for us. Jesus did not just come to empty your life of bad things. He has come to fill your life with good things. And so that's what this story is about. We are all in a position where um, life looks very different from us right now. And maybe you are identifying some of the ways you feel empty. Yeah. You haven't done something you shouldn't do. You're just empty. And what Jesus would say is, you're at risk. And it would be really easy for a person like me to say, you just need to do some things that look spiritual. And what Jesus identifies as you can be clean and in order and at risk. That his spirit needs to come into our lives. That we need to have a conversation with him. That we need to, to talk to him and invite him into our lives and let him speak into our lives and direct us and sometimes correct us and to welcome his presence in worship and to welcome his words in scripture. 
and to welcome his, his promptings in prayer. And that when we do that, our life begins to be filled with something that will act far stronger as a resistance against an invisible enemy than anything we could possibly imagine. So let me just pray with you uh, this morning. Uh, Father, um, it's true. Sometimes we focus on just getting things clean and organized. And we feel better when we do. But you reveal in your word that that's, that's not enough. It's not bad. It's just not enough. And that an empty life is susceptible. So would you help us today? Would you help us see our own emptiness? Would you help us see the places and the spaces that you could move in and the difference you could make? Help us welcome your presence, your word. Help us listen to your promptings. Take up your abode in us. Fill us with your spirit. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.